Well, friends, it's been a fun last six weeks as we've been in our series on the book Called, and we concluded that last week, and uh, it was just really, I think, a great uh, time together as we worked through that idea. But today, we actually continue on with this theme about called or being called to follow Jesus, and so it's fun for me how this text connects in with that. Um, we're, we're now going to be in the book of Acts for a few weeks, and uh, The book of Acts has long been my favorite book in the whole Bible for a number of reasons, and a couple of those. First of all, uh, in the book of Acts, you see what happened when the Christian church first came to be. Uh, The book of Acts starts with where Jesus, he's been uh, killed, he's been crucified, and he's risen, and he's going to heaven, and he hands off his ministry, his mission to his followers. And he says, now go, go and do this work I've given you to do. Go and do this work I've called you to do. And so the book of Acts tells the story of how the Christian church came to be, how this faith went from a handful of disciples to now this worldwide movement that we're a part of. But what I especially love as I read the book of Acts is to see all the way through normal everyday people like you and I responding to God and by the power of the Spirit seeing God do really amazing things. And so throughout the book of Acts, you see the Holy Spirit showing up in the middle of people's lives and powerful things happening. And and so for me anyway, reading the book of Acts, it's powerful and inspiring and interesting and exciting. And so it's fun for me anyway, that we get to be in this book for a few weeks here. And today we're going to read the story about one of the most famous people in Christian history, uh, the man named Paul, who at first was named Saul and then became Paul. And in today's in today's reading, we hear about how that transformation happened. But there's bigger background that I need you to be aware of. Maybe you already know this, but this man, Saul, who became Paul, when he becomes Paul, he ends up being the greatest missionary in the history of Christianity. In fact, he's, he wrote about half of the New Testament. As we read through the Bible, he wrote about half of the New Testament, and he started churches all over the Mediterranean world. So Christianity is just beginning, and he starts churches all over the Mediterranean. But what's really incredible about Paul's story is who he was before he became Paul. Because he, when he was Saul, he was, actually, um, he was actually Christianity's greatest enemy, our greatest enemy. He hated Christians with a passion, and he actually went around trying to round up Christians and either have them killed or have them put in prison. So imagine with me for a moment, this man hated Christianity with a passion, becomes the Christian faith's greatest missionary. Are you tracking with me here? Okay, this isn't just some nice story about, oh, this guy named Paul started a lot of churches. Isn't that fun? This is a man who hated Christians with a passion, who actually had Christians murdered and thrown in prison for their faith, becomes the greatest missionary in the history of the church. Well, that didn't just happen magically, right? God did something in the midst of that, something incredibly powerful. And it's really quite a story of transformation. So today we get um, part of that story. But there's also another character, another person in this story that I want you to pay attention to, and that is Ananias. Ananias is a normal believer just like you and I. As far as we know, there's nothing uh, particularly special about Ananias. He's not well known as a church leader or a pastor or a missionary or disciple. He's just a regular faithful person trying to live his faith, and God works through him in a really important way. So as you hear this story today, I want you to listen for some of those things, but we're going to work our way through here in little chunks at a time, okay? So let's begin at the beginning of Acts chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues, the churches in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. The way was at the time what they were calling these people following Jesus, the way. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So let's set the stage. So Saul has gone to the high priest to get letters because he's going to go to Damascus to do what? What's he going to do there? Arrest people. Who's he, what people is he going to arrest? Followers of Jesus. He's going to arrest followers of Jesus. 
So he's on a mission to go capture as many Christians as he can with the sole purpose of dragging them back to Jerusalem in chains to have them imprisoned and hopefully killed, ultimately. Okay, so do you understand? This is a guy who hates, literally hates Christians. Okay, now his background is he is trained as a Pharisee. He's been trained by one of the most famous rabbis in the Jewish tradition. He's a very bright person, very well schooled, and he's passionate about his faith. And what I want you to understand here at the beginning is he's doing this because he thinks he's doing the right thing to honor God. He thinks that these people that believe in Jesus, they've got it all wrong. They're distorting the faith and he's gonna stop at nothing to protect God from them, protect his church from them. And so he, by his own passion for his faith, has, ter- has allowed hatred to overcome him and he's going to stop Christianity at all costs. Wow. So on his way to Damascus to round up Christians to throw them in prison. And now things get interesting. As he's approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Wow. Okay, something unbelievable just happened here, didn't it? So Saul's on his way to Damascus with one thing in mind. I'm gonna round up as many Christians as I can round up and bam, God shows up. God shows up in this incredible way that knocks him to the ground and he audibly hears Jesus' voice telling him to stop persecuting him. Now clearly God had to do something big time to get Paul's attention, didn't he? God needed to get his attention, wake him up, and it took this incredible act of God to do that. But we're going to find out later that God had good reason for this. But here he is, Paul's on the ground, he's given instructions to go into Damascus to see what's going to happen next, and then the reading continues. The men with Saul stood speechless, so there was a couple guys with him. For they had heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now put yourself in Saul's place for a moment, trying to make sense out of all of this, right? He's devoted his life to following God and he's believed now that his mission is to round up as many Christians as he can. And suddenly he thinks he heard Jesus tell him to stop it and he's blind. And for three days he's sitting there in Damascus, now blind, not eating or drinking, and he's just got all this time to think. What is going on? What is this about? Why is this happening? He's trying to make sense of all of it, right? And you can imagine the wheels that are turning and the, thing, the inner turmoil as he's trying to make sense of all of this and try to, you know, he's probably coming up with reasons like, did this really happen? Am I making it up? What's going on here? And then there's something else happening at the same time. At the same time that this is going on with Saul, God is also speaking to someone else, this man named Ananias. Verse 10. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Okay. Anybody else get those kind of clear directions from God, (laughs) right? He gets really clear directions. Go to Straight Street, to the house of Judas, and when you get there, ask for a man named Saul from Tarsus. And by the way, I've told him you're coming. (laughs) Right? Like, I've already told him you're coming, man. But obviously, we don't typically get those kinds of crystal clear directions from God. That doesn't mean we won't ever, but we don't typically. But here we have this man, Ananias. We don't know really anything about him. But I would say we could assume from the text 
that at a minimum, Ananias has part of his, his practice is to be open and listening to God's prompting, right? Ananias clearly hears God speak, and it doesn't seem to surprise him that God is speaking. And I want us to note that, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, because Ananias clearly is available to God in this moment. Now, let me ask you this. If you were Ananias, how do you think you might respond? Because here's the deal. All the Christians in Damascus have been warned that Saul's coming to town. They know that he's coming and they know why he's coming. So the Christians in Damascus are afraid for their lives right now. So you're Ananias and you've heard about Saul and now God is saying to you, hey, I want you to go talk to him. What's your response? You sure about that, God? You you know who we're talking about, right? Um, Well, I told him, but of course God said, I told him that a man named Ananias is coming. There's probably not too many Ananiases in town, unfortunately for him. So, right, we all put ourselves in his place, and we can imagine the, I don't know about this, God. And that's exactly what Ananias says in verse 13. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias protests. He says, God, you know, I mean, with good reason, Ananias says, you know, I've heard about this guy. There's no way I can't do this. And God says, go. Because I've got plans for Saul. I've got plans. I'm going to use him to take my word to the Gentiles and to kings. In fact, Paul ends up impacting Caesar. At the end of his life, when Paul is in prison in Rome, this man, Saul, ultimately gets put in prison in Rome. He has the opportunity to share the gospel with the people living in Caesar's household. Of course, God in this moment sees to that time, doesn't he? And God comes to Ananias and says, Ananias, I need you to go do this thing. And I know it sounds crazy and it's risky and it's probably something that you really don't want to do, but I've got plans for Saul. And so I need you to be faithful in this moment and go see him. Wow. Wow. So, verse 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Now, the story about Saul, Paul, about Paul goes on from here with Paul starting churches, like I said, all over the Mediterranean. He becomes the greatest missionary in the history of the church. He gets a chance to influence Caesar's court. He has one of the greatest impacts on the world of anybody in history. He's written about half of the New Testament, which is the book by far most published of all time. People read his words all over the world. People read this man's words. Incredible what ends up happening with this man who days before, was intent on killing as many Christians as he could. There's a, lot, there's a few really important points I want to pull out from this passage today as we wrestle with it and think about it. And I want to start there with Paul. The, the idea that God could take this person who has so much hatred in his heart and transform him into a person who spreads God's good news of love and grace and mercy around the world is really unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, if you were going to pick someone to do that, the last one would be this guy who hates Christians with every part of his being. But that's who God chose. There's a couple of things I want you to get about that. One, God can transform anyone. God can transform anyone. 
that it first of all includes you, no matter where you've been, what you've done, no matter what you have inside of you, God can transform those things. And God can work through you in powerful ways. That means that God never gives up on you and you never get too far away from God. But it also means that God can do that with everyone else as well. And so those people that we are tempted to write off, those people that we are tempted to say, you know, they're, they're too far gone, I believe nothing's impossible for God. And I think part of our Christian call is to always try to see people with God's eyes and to believe what God can believe about them, that anything is possible. Let's always be aware of this, that God has an incredible ability to transform each and every one of us. And we should desire that for ourselves, and we should desire that for others. But we always see the best in people, and we know that God can do miraculous things with them. Even those who we think are the least likely, the last ones we would choose, surprise, God can use them. There's another piece here about Paul that I don't want us to miss. Do you know the things that Paul possessed, the gifts that he had that made him this incredible missionary? Uh, those things were his passion for his faith, uh, his conviction, his, his ability to communicate. Do you know those were the very same gifts that made him so good at the thing he was doing over here? Now let that sink in for a moment. One of the things that we need to be aware of is that our all of us have a shadow side and our gifts and our abilities can be used for wonderful good and also for wonderful evil. And it's important that we are always aware of that shadow side and how we can be misguided. Because when Saul was over here hating Christians, he thought he was honoring God. It was his passion for his faith that drove him to pursue Christians like he did. But he allowed, he allowed hatred to take over, and he allowed that to be his motivating force. Okay, when Paul gets transformed here by Jesus, it's actually important, this verse that I, I read, read over it and didn't say anything. Did you catch verse uh, 16? Paul says, or God says to Ananias, and I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. See, what happens to Saul in this transformation is he's humbled. Because over here, he's a very proud man who knows, who knows his, his station, that he is brighter than most everyone else, that he is this gifted person who, who has charisma and people will follow, and he, he, he allows the evil one to turn that and twist that. God humbles him in this, and as Paul goes forward, he uses those same gifts in a very different way. And so he uses those gifts in humility and in love to build up and encourage. But don't miss that it's the very same gifts that he's using, but he's allowing God to work through him in a different way than he was over here. And we all need to recognize that in ourselves. Do we allow God to break us when we need to be broken? And do we allow God to transform us and use our gifts the way God intends? One last thing I where I want us ultimately to land today. And this is around Ananias. You know, as we think of people of faith and we think of how we live out our faith, we tend to look at those heroes like Paul. And we think, man, those are the people of faith. Or maybe we look at pastors or evangelists, whoever it is, and we think, well, those are the God people. And they, you know, they do these amazing God things and great. And, and what Paul has done for, for the world is, is amazing. But this story hinges on the faithfulness of Ananias, doesn't it? This story hinges on the faithfulness of Ananias. Ananias, as far as we know, was an ordinary, everyday person. Just a guy. But he was a guy who was open to God's leading. And that's the key. My assumption in reading this story is that Ananias was doing what Ananias always does which is go about his business, but to do so with his ear in tune to what God might be saying to him. I think it was Ananias' practice to faithfully follow God. And so when God comes to him with this big, th this big little thing, he protests, but then he says, okay, God, and he does it. 
This thing that God asked Ananias to do, how many of us would actually do it? If we knew that someone had come to town whose, whose very presence was a threat to us, and then we, heard, we thought God was saying, go talk to them, I'm guessing that a lot of us would say, no way. I must be hearing things, I'm making it up, or surely someone else can do it. Right? We are like Ananias. Regular, ordinary people called by God to follow daily in simple ways. But it's that practice of daily being faithful to that call that's so important. Just daily being faithful to the call. Because we never know when God's gonna say, okay, today I really need you to do something. And when it is our practice to respond to God faithfully, we're ready. Okay, God, I'll do it. I'll do it. We don't ever hear from, about Ananias again. But because of his response to God, Paul goes and changes the world. So I wonder all the ways where you quietly are faithful to God that end up changing the world and you don't even realize it. I wonder about all the ways that faithful people throughout the centuries just quietly living their faith faithfully saying yes to God, have had a tremendous impact. That's what we do as the church, my friends. And that's why we say here at New Heights that it takes all of us living this faith. So as we've been through this series on called, we landed at this place where we said, listen, it's ultimately about following Jesus today. That is resting in God's presence and being open to God's leading. And we see that in Ananias today. That we... Follow when we're called. You and I, we are called to follow, to listen, to be ready to move faithfully. It's amazing to me that, that something like this, so pro, the profoundly changed history happened as Ananias just simply faithfully responded to God's movement in his life. We get to do the same thing. Let's pray. Oh, awesome God. We are challenged today. We're challenged to consider that maybe, maybe you could use this in bigger ways than we ever imagined. We're challenged today to consider that maybe just simply being faithful each day makes for something much bigger and important than we ever could have imagined. We're challenged today to consider that you want us to simply listen and be open and follow. And that as we do so, lives may actually be changed. God, we are grateful that you are a God who powerfully transforms lives. We're grateful that you are a God who never gives up on any of us. We're grateful that you are a God who chooses to work through all of us. Sometimes big fancy people like Paul and sometimes simple regular people like us, like Ananias. We ask you to help us today to just simply be open to you and to practice being faithful to you each day. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.